Good evening. I'm Suzanne Kavik, president of the League of Women Voters of Newcastle. It is the League's pleasure to welcome you tonight to Action Civics, a 21st century approach to educating youth for democratic participation, a conversation with Denora Gadichu. The League is a grassroots nonpartisan organization that promotes the active and informed participation of all citizens in government. Voter education and engagement is one of the League's most important functions. This evening's proceedings are being taped by the Newcastle Community Media Center and are being live streamed on YouTube. They will be available on demand at nccmc.com and YouTube. All other recording is strictly pro prohibited. If you are joining us on the Zoom platform, you will have the opportunity to ask questions following the presentation by typing them into the chat. Alexandra Holt, a Newcastle League board member, is helping monitor the chat tonight, so she'll read any questions put there. Duplicate questions may be combined. Our discussion tonight will be facilitated by Newcastle League board member, Lee Barth. Our speaker this evening, Denora Gedichu, is the New York Executive Director of Generation Citizen, a national, nonpartisan, nonprofit dedicated to transforming how civics education is taught in secondary schools. Denora began her career working on local democracy and government reform at the New York City Council. She has worked at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law for public advocate Bill de Blasio and at Citizens Union. Denora was a member of the New York State Public Campaign Financing Commission and the New York State Department of Education Civic Action Readiness Task Force. Please join me in welcoming Denora Gedichu. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, I was like, am I jumping in? Are you jumping in? Yeah, um, I just wanted to say um, before, when we started, uh, I just looked back at my emails in uh, preparation for this, and I saw that we started planning this event 11 months ago. Um, and we were stymied by ice storms and a pandemic, but finally the third time is, the ch is a charm. So. Um, to me, over that year, this topic of youth civic engagement has just become more uh, urgent and relevant. And so I'm just really happy that we're finally here uh, tonight and we have a great audience so that we can uh, talk about action civics and youth uh, civic participation. So um, if you could tell us maybe about what Generation Citizen is and, and what the model is that you use there. Absolutely. And thank you to everyone for joining this evening and hello out there to YouTube and so good to finally be in conversation with you, Lee. I think that that 11 month trajectory is a manifestation of what we say at Generation Citizen that democracy doesn't pause, right? So we have to continue to make to do the important work to make sure that young people in particular understand why it matters in this moment for them to participate. Um, I am, as, as was introduced, the Denora Gattacho, the New York Executive Director at Generation Citizen. Um, I like to go by the name Democracy Ninja. So if you're looking for me on, on Instagram, um, I'm at Democracy Ninja or on Twitter at Denora Gattacho. Uh, I'm so honored to be here this evening just to talk to you all about the importance of action civics and the work we do at Generation Citizen. Um, as was described, we're a 10 year old national nonprofit. We started on a college campus uh, back at Brown University at a very different moment in our democracy. Um, but an equally important one. Our co-founder and CEO, Scott Warren, at the time was a student at Brown. And it was before the 2008 election cycle, right? So there was all this energy and optimism and enthusiasm and passion, just much, very much like this moment, but in a different um, ethos, if you will, a little bit. Really, people were committed to being a part of a democracy and really making their voices heard. And what resonated for Scott at that time was really this notion that you know, people are so excited to participate in federal elections, but they don't show up and wait in line. They don't, um, you know, rally their friends and their neighbors and their households to participate in, in very local elections where real decision making and power rests. And so Generation Citizen was founded with that ideal in mind. How can we make sure that we're reinvigorating civic participation by getting civics education back in the classrooms, making it action oriented and experiential? Um, for those of you out there, you might remember that we learned civics, uh, some of us were a little bit older, in a very rote memorization way, right? So we all had Schoolhouse Rock, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. And while that is an exciting, was an exciting way to learn back then, in a 21st century democracy where we all have phones at our disposal and can, you know, now are living all of our lives online, that doesn't resonate. The notion of memorizing how democracy works and then figuring out what to do with that information 
cannot motivate a middle or high school student to get engaged, to actually claim their civic power. And so our work at Generation Citizen is to really bring civics education back to life, put it in the hands of young people, let them be in the driver's seat of their own civic experience by getting them to understand, yes, they need that core civic knowledge, but they also really need to understand the then what. If you have a problem in your community and you know who your local decision makers are, then what do you do about that, right? And so for all of the educators and administrators out there as well, grappling with back to school and what this moment means, the sense that I get when I talk to young people is that they feel empowered, but they don't feel like people are listening. And more importantly, they don't think that anything is changing. The power of Generation Citizen and Action Civics is that we are giving educators the resources, the knowledge, the professional development and coaching to make civics education actually be one of the most exciting topics in the classroom, no matter if that's a virtual classroom, a hybrid classroom, or an in-person classroom. Great, and, and can you give us a little bit, because I know that when we've talked about this, it's very inspiring. Uh, how did you personally get to this work? Because you've done a lot of different uh, civically engaged, uh, community-oriented things, but um, your personal trajectory is really very interesting. Sure, and I'm happy to share that. Hopefully it's interesting to the listeners tonight, but what I'd say is, you know, I, the reason I do this work at Generation Citizen, the reason I think Action Civics and the way that we deliver our curriculum is so powerful is because I could have been one of those students. I, I was one of those students. So I went to a public high school in Harlem um, and at the time I was a pregnant teen and my um, pregnancy was seen as a distraction to my school community and I was uh, encouraged to transfer to an alternative high school for pregnant girls in order to finish my studies. Um, and so anybody who knows me well, despite now being a ninja for democracy, I am a rule follower, right? So, and my mom is a rule follower too. And so we um, trusted the recommendation of our school leaders and we went to visit that uh, transfer school. And what I learned very quickly was while the school had childcare, they didn't have rigorous academics, right? So I was an honor roll student taking AP courses, but I also had made a choice to have a child as a young adult. Um, and so I, you know, appealed that decision, kind of launched my own first advocacy campaign unwittingly without the knowledge, without the Generation Citizen, without the Action Civics to contact my local government stakeholders and to advocate for myself. And I think that's what's so powerful, right? If I look back now, we'll say 23 years later, because my son is now almost 24 years old, it is that learning that you can actually have a sense of civic agency. It's one thing to protest in the streets or to tweet the action that you wanna to do today. It's a whole nother to understand the fundamentals of how government works and then connect that with a systemic solution, right? So in my instance as a 17 year old or a 16 year old going on 17, it was how do I stay in my school and graduate on time with my peers and have access to rigorous academics? Who are the decision makers? And then how do I get to them to make the case, right? So it wasn't just like, I'm gonna complain and I'm gonna cry, I'm gonna be upset, I'm gonna actually turn that into action. And so, you know, what I think is so interesting about my own trajectory is that it mimics that work that we're trying to have sparked in the Generation Citizen classroom of really getting young people to understand it's okay to complain. We all complain, right? Like I wake up on any given day, especially in the last seven months, and I feel like I do more complaining than anything else. But then I was like, then what do you do about that, right? And so, you know, over the course of my own career, I went from being that pregnant teen to uh, graduating college and going to Fordham Law School. Um, I started out as was her, described in my bio, working as a legislative attorney at the New York City Council. Um, and I, it was interesting now that I look back, you know, 15 years later, um, the choice for me was, did I wanna be the attorney that worked for the education committee or did I wanna be the attorney who led the government affairs committee um, that did more government oversight, elections, campaign finance reform. And I chose door number two, right? And it was, it's interesting now after all of those years to see that my path has led me to a place where there, I sit at the intersection of that work, right? So Generation Citizens work is both democracy and it's education. Um, and really, as I like to describe it, demystifying democracy for young people who've never really been invited to the conversation. Um, so I worked at the city council, oversaw election modernization at the city level. I worked uh, at a good government organization that often partners with the legal one voters uh, by the name of Citizens Union and really did some state and local advocacy around ethics reform and campaign finance reform, which who knew that would all come back <laughs> to, to be a blessing and a curse for me in my career and my leadership and service. But powerful work then. Um, had the pleasure of serving 
as public advocate Bill de Blasio or then public advocate Bill de Blasio's policy director um, and had a chance to telescope out a little bit, right? Like not just do good government reform, not just do um, elections and campaign finance, really think about the needs of vulnerable New Yorkers writ large and like what did that mean to understand the intersection of democracy and those policy issues. And then um, took some time out of the workforce. So I have two younger children, hopefully whom will not come in this evening because they have done their homework and they're getting a little bit of a downtime before school tomorrow. Um, and then when I went back into the workforce, I worked at the Brennan Center because I knew my passion really was in democracy reform work. And so I worked there uh, for three years before coming to Generation Citizen. And again, the, the power to me of my past and being now a Generation Citizen is that connection between, you know, a lot of my career has been spent really thinking about how to eliminate structural barriers to participation. And what I realized is that even if we do all of that good work to make sure that there is early voting, online voter registration, automatic voter registration, like really getting rid of all of the obstacles that exist, if everyday New Yorkers don't actually then go participate, that will be for naught. And so what I think is the power of Generation Citizen and Action Civics is that we are giving young people the knowledge, the skills, the power in their own hands so then what? That what are they going to do now that they understand the rules of the game? And so, and I think because I've I've been to one of the civics day, the model is also premised on for kids when this is their first engagement with civics is um, sort of that beyond tokenism, which is what is relevant to them. They generate the the thing, the problem that they see in their community, not an adult telling them this is the problem you tackle it. So. How does that work in terms of getting the kids to come up with, with the problem or the thing that they see, something that they can actually work on and, and, and you get a group to do that? Um, so, I mean, for all the educators and administrators out there, you know this way better than I do. Put 25, 30 young people in a classroom together and ask them, what's the one issue they care about, right? Like they could write it, they could write a list as long as New York probably, right? Um, whether or not like it's a community issue or is it a household issue? Is it, you know, is it a city issue, a neighborhood issue, et cetera? We really then just get them to explore, understand what are those issues and how do they relate to their lives? Um, how, who are the decision makers that are influencing those issues, right? So it's one thing to say, I care about policing, but is that a federal issue? Is that a municipal issue? Is it a state issue? Is it a combination? Who are those decision makers and influencers, right? Because most young people can name the president and they know about the branches of government at the federal level, but they don't know their town council. They don't know their local mayor. They don't understand how that all works and how budgets are allocated necessarily. And so we teach young people to go from just that issue identification to do and engage in a novel exercise that us all, adults probably can't always do, which is like, how do you build consensus, right? So we have the laundry list of issues that we are concerned about. Let's all work together as a class, actually build consensus, talk past divide, and reach a consensus on one issue that we're all gonna work together on as a class, right? So the pedagogy is really thinking about 21st century workforce skills as well, right? Like you need to do issue, you need to um, understand the problem, you need to conduct research, you need to make sure that you have trusted sources, and then you need to build that coalition. You need to get your colleagues involved, you need to actually be a part of the process together. Um, once they do that and they really have identified what is the one focus issue they're gonna work on, then they're breaking up into groups, right? So what's so powerful about this, about action civics is that it's really teaching young people again, project-based learning, right? Like it's not just, we're gonna memorize things and then we'll take this test later. You know, I'll digress for one minute to say to me, one of the silver linings of this incredibly disrupted moment is that it is giving educators a chance to really think outside the box about how to engage their students, right? Like there are so many travesties of this moment and sometimes the hardest thing for educators is just to get the student on the screen. But what we've heard from educators who've done action civics, even despite the pandemic, they've realized that it can be adaptable to asynchronous learning environments. And there really are opportunities for young people to take more ownership of what they're learning. And when that is happening, you can get the young person to come on screen and really think, right? Because they're also watching the civic and racial, and I'm going to keep saying gender reckoning moment because I couldn't be in a conversation with the legal and voters at this in this historic moment for the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and not also talk about that the gender reckoning that has to happen, right? Like, um, and young people are seeing that, they're witnessing it, and more importantly, they're taking lead and charge, right? So the power of the work 
is that it's giving educators the pedagogical approach to be able to facilitate that, to actually take young people's frustration with, I don't miss whatever, I hate this, I don't wanna learn this, to, oh, this is what's happening in my community, here's the current event that I'm feeling, oh, I was at the protest this weekend, how do I actually do something about police brutality, underfunded schools, you name it, right? Um, so they're actually engaging in systemic policy work, right, as a collective. They're writing their elected officials, they're drafting policy, they're writing op-eds, they're, they're doing a lot of the things they're doing disconnected from a school environment in, in a school environment with more educational support and encouragement. And it's really giving them a chance to actually, if you will, flex their civic muscle, because it's a habit, right? Like we have to all learn. I have um, eight and soon to be 10 year old daughters. And if you ask them right now, they believe that we are going to vote on election day. And I'm like, it is my vote that I bring you along as a part of the process. They're like, well, who are we voting for, right? So it, it is an important civic habit we all have to learn, but we have to learn it and keep practicing it. And so what's powerful about action civics is yes, it's happening in that history or social studies or civics classroom. It could also happen in the ELA classroom, but no matter where it happens, once students leave the classroom, that is a set of transferable skills and a set of knowledge that they can take with them wherever they go. And then they can continue to practice, right? In what I like to call that full contact sport, that is democracy. Right, and, and uh, how would you advise, say community organizations that might wanna engage in that same model? Um, you know, it, it's something, and I know, you know, so League of Women Voters, if we have a youth organization, Girl Scouts, mm -hmm. um, other community-based organizations, how do you um, do it where it's outside the classroom? Sort of same model, but take it outside actually into some sort of community-based group. Yeah, no, there are a couple of ways that Generation Citizen partners explicitly with community-based organizations. Mm -hmm. The first and most um, impactful way is, the, is through our curriculum, right? A, co a key component of our curricular approach is really having guest speakers come into the classroom, be that in virtual or in um, in-person settings and actually help advise the students about their policy solution, right? So, you know, with all due respect to young people, not every idea they come up with is novel, right? There has been work that has been done in the, on those um, topics in the past. And what we want them to be thinking about is not just the, you know, the one hit, one click wonder that they're going to tweet today and then move on to the next thing. I don't want young people to be slacktivists. I, um, I like to say I'm millennial adjacent, so I understand how technology works, but I think that they have to go beyond just the tweeting and the hugging on things on the internet and then actually think, okay, well, what policy movements are already out there? How do I help fuel those campaigns? Maybe there are creative solutions I can add to the discussion. And that is a good place where community-based organizations can add value to advise the students on their action projects and think like, oh, you care about, you know, um, getting your school to get a tax abatement to be able to build, um, to build solar panels on your roof and have a greenhouse. Great, there are state programs you can tap into for that and that's how you access that. Um, and so often we do invite nonprofits who are doing community-based work, policy work to engage and advise our young people about how they can continue the goal of their action project. Other ways that we can collaborate with Girl Scouts and the leagues and other common cause, other nonprofits like that is actually being an off ramp, right? If young people care about an issue that is specific to what's going on um, in their classroom and they wanna continue that work or something completely separate, we often connect them with other nonprofits who, can, who have civic engagement expertise and can be a hub for those young people to further their journey. Um, back in 2016, before the last election, so Generation Citizen, I guess, measures itself in elections, right? I mentioned we were founded in the 2008 election cycle. Um, I joined GC right before the 2016 election cycle. So I'm coming up on my four-year anniversary in a couple weeks. And we launched this campaign right after the election, but planned in advance that was called Go Beyond the Ballot, right? We all talk about voting and it is such a fundamental and um, important civic responsibility. So no one should leave this conversation saying Denora Gattaccio said, don't vote. That's not what I say, that I would be the opposite of being a ninja for democracy if I said that. But we don't then remember all of the actions that have to happen between elections, right? Like what it takes to actually hold elected officials accountable, to do the good work that the legal and voters and other nonprofits do, to go to Albany, to call the elected officials to push for systemic change. Um, and so one of the powerful things about that go beyond the ballot campaign was that it was a series of resources for educators and discussion guides and conversations, toolkits for parents 
to actually talk about how to be civically engaged. And so one of the ways that we collaborate with other nonprofits is to help do some of those trainings for young people, sometimes even for adults, to talk about what does it mean to be civically engaged. Um, we are relaunching that campaign this week and we'll have new additional resources to be able to put out to provide to community-based organizations that want to think about, you know, what do they do in out-of-school time? How do they engage those who are already in their population? Great. So, um, yeah, I think there are so many places where the, the interests of the league and um, the work that Generation Citizen has, does and the work that you've done have really intersected. Um, you know, there's so many of the common threads, things we're all working on. And I know this year, um, you sort of alluded to it, you know, you spent a lot of time in Albany um, with the Civic Readiness Task Force and then with the Public Campaign Financing Commission. Oh boy. I know the Public Campaign Financing Commission is a little off topic, but um, you know, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, those projects that you were on and what you learned <laughs> over the last year from that work. I, and I say this not because it's one of my favorite taglines, but because it's true. I think from both of those task force, I learned that democracy really is a full context board, right? So like in many respects, I was sitting at the table often as the substantive policy person who's trying to push for change, right? And, you know, I'll take the, the civic readiness task force first because I think it's most germane to this conversation and, and follows more closely. Um, I was appointed uh, to a task force of about 25 to 30 members statewide that had a goal and a charge from the state education department to really think about a 21st century civic standard. What does it mean for New York State to say that every student will graduate from public schools in New York or from K-12 in New York and be civic ready? What does that mean? I don't even know what that phrase means, right? But the state education department put that in their federal um, education plan and it was approved by the federal government. So they had to actually bring it to life. And so they appointed this task force of individuals to really help define civic readiness in New York. And then to go a step further, right? So civic readiness in New York, what does that mean? Um, what we believe it means, the members of the task force, and we believe the state education department agrees and will adopt those recommendations is that over the course of young people's um, academic career in, in schools in New York state, they will develop the civic mindsets, knowledge, dispositions, behaviors, attitudes, experiences that will make them prepared to participate in 21st century democracy, right? Um, and so it is the job of the education system writ large. I would love to drill down and more and say like, who's gonna do that, right? Like, is everybody gonna point to someone else? But for now, let's say the education system writ large is going to make sure that young people get the right types of experiences and exposures, but also education to make sure they can serve on a jury, that they're prepared to register to vote, they're prepared to participate in democracy. That's a powerful step forward for New York, right? To be in the vanguard of defining what civic readiness means and committing to it. What we also did as a task force is, you know, we heard from the community, we listened and, and looked at the research and proposed that New York State offer a, a diploma seal that students can achieve that says that they are civic ready. So they will complete all the mandatory regents requirements that they already have to complete in coursework but they can also complete a capstone, very similar to what they do in a Generation Citizen classroom where they are putting together an action project where they're actually pitching their ideas and proposing concrete systemic solutions. And they will pitch that and propose that to their local district um, as a demonstration of their civic readiness. And so um, the hope is that you know, in the 21-22 school year, there will be a pilot program that rolls out where districts will begin to offer this diploma seal of civic readiness. And then ultimately in the 22-23 school year that statewide that seal will be offered. Uh, Generation Citizen recently put out a paper, a white paper really looking at civic seals, uh, diploma seals around the country, including a couple states that have offered a similar diploma seal for civic readiness or civic, um, civic participation. And what we said fundamentally is, and I, I would hope that the educators and administrators in the audience would agree, you cannot have an unfunded mandate that requires the offering of a, of a seal like this without providing professional development and support to teachers to be able to support this learning in the classroom, right? Um, and so one of the things we really wanna see come out of the recommendations from this task force is a meaningful commitment to that. I'll be obviously candid and honest in recognizing that we are in a very different fiscal reality now than we were back in uh, the end of 2019 when the task force officially concluded its work. 
And so the state education department has decided to delay the implementation of the pilot, like I said, till next school year, the 21-22 school year. I, I don't suspect that there's a magic wand that's gonna fix our fiscal woes, but the reality is, is that if this is going to be offered, it has to be offered equitably around the state. So it can't just be well-resourced well -resourced districts taking up this opportunity and allowing students um, the opportunity to achieve this diploma seal. It has to be offered to students regardless of whether they go to a public high school in Harlem like I did, or whether they go to a, you know, the top performing school on the Upper East Side or you know, anywhere in between. And so I think that is really what we are pushing for at Generation Citizen is making sure that this is holistic, that there are resources to support it and that educators can actually um, support students with achieving the SEAL. Um, I would say as it relates to the work of the Civic Readiness Task Force, that was definitely the easy, the, the um, less troublesome of <laughs> my two commitments last year. Um, though I appreciated the opportunity to be a servant leader in that volunteer regard. I also spent a significant amount of time on this campaign finance commission, right? So it took me back to my days of being a good government advocate, the work I did at Citizens Union and um, as a young attorney at the city council and for the Brennan Center. Um, and it was important work to do and be able to bring that perspective to the table and think about, again, that's just like twofold civic participation and structural barriers to participation, right? So I still care deeply about the work that is on that other side of the table as we think about structural barriers. Um, we cannot have a more reflective and accessible and inclusive democracy if we, everybody can't run for office or people cannot, people without means can't afford to run for office. And so I was fortunate to be appointed by uh, Senate Majority Leader Andrew Stewart Cousins to serve on this campaign financing, public financing tech commission. Um, it was it was a learning experience for sure. <laughs> um, you know, I definitely sat at the intersection of policy and politics in a way that I had never done in my entire career. And so even just that, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have learned about how it all works, right? It's one thing to be a legislative attorney and a municipal legislative branch, a whole nother to sit at the table with appointees from the governor's office and the, um, the Senate minority and the Senate majority and um, the assembly minority and majority and really have to actually build consensus, right? Like we had our charge. It was very clear that the goal was for us to make a recommendation around a public financing system, uh, whether that was modeled on New York City's successful system that I also had a hand in revising um, when I was a, a young attorney or some other model, right? We've seen lots of other models crop up around vouchers and, and um, fully funded systems. The reality was we had to actually read the research and actually propose a system that fit within the state mandate around how much money we could allocate and, and what type of charge we had. Um, and being able to build consensus literally across the table with you know Republican members of the legislature and Democratic members of the legislature to think about how do we get to the end result, right? And the end result wasn't the perfect system I thought um, could have been the case. And I think there were members of the commission who also didn't feel like it was the perfect outcome for them too. But it reminded me, right? That again, it's this notion of like, how do you, um, build your coalition? How do you make better arguments? How do you encourage people to talk across divide and not just say, well, that's not what I want, so I'm not doing it. Um, and in the end, I felt good about, I was able to vote in support of the system we proposed because it was, I knew the best outcome we could get given um, all of the, the different interests at the table. And so um, I definitely took my political beatings on that front, but I am, you know, I felt good about the ability to design a system that will enable more people from diverse backgrounds across the state, you know, be it ethnically or socioeconomically to run for office and to represent, have the chance to uh, represent their communities. And so that's a, a powerful win for New York, fingers crossed, if like the money stays allocated to be able to, to launch that system in the future. I, I think that also um, comes to sort of my last question, which is, you know, you you don't, even when you're in this, when you engage in the work, you don't always get everything you want. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you tell young people as they begin to engage in the civic arena? Like, mm -hmm. how do you guys frame that in terms of, um, you're going to do a lot of hard work, um, but you, you may not always get everything you want out of this. You may not get 100% of what you want. Mm -hmm. I think that's the power of this moment that we're living in right now, right? Is that there is like, um, you know, I said earlier that I, I'm millennial adjacent, so I understand how the technology works. And I think there are ways that we can use it in, to our advantage to be able to fuel systemic change and, and accelerate social movements, right? But the reality is 
systemic change takes time. And that's what we teach through our curriculum is that, you know, even look at the 19th Amendment, for example, right, from the time of Seneca Falls to the time that it was signed, that was 72 years, right? And for young people, I'm like, do you know how long 72 years is, right? And for some of them, that's like, a, they can reflect on a grandparent, right? Or someone who has lived that long in, in honor of Grandparents Day yesterday. Um, but that, you know, yes, that has been accelerated for younger generations, right? So even, you know, the fight for marriage equality was accelerated, maybe, you know, it was 20 plus years. Sometimes we're gonna get the incremental victory towards the systemic change in a, in a fast amount of time. And you can definitely use and leverage social media to push the levers of change more quickly. And um, you know, I like to say, use all the tools in the toolbox to push for that. But young people also need to understand that they can't be defeated when they don't win immediately, right? And I think there's something, there's such a tension in this moment about how social media really allows everyone to feel like everything is instant and everything, oh, it just happened. And it's like, no, they didn't like, lots of other other factors had to play out a certain way for the the win to come to fruition and that's often not how the media covers it not how the history books talk about it not even how all of us as parents and educators in formal and informal ways talk about it and so i think the work of generation citizen is to concretize how systemic change works really get young people to understand that notion and yes to be able to celebrate those incremental victories because i am i'll be the first one to want to take the victory lap and i think they should but then it's always about what's next, right? Like, so you won this small battle, right? Like how do you ultimately win the war, whatever that is, like, or how do you win the ultimate goal um, and not to be defeated, right? Cause I do think there is some sense in this moment of like, well, I can go lurch to the other thing. I'll just, I'll go focus my energies on the other thing. Um, we often in the classroom really talk about what is, you know, what is the systemic policy solution that you want to keep working towards and know that it's, you're going to use many different tactics to try to accomplish that, some of which will, like I said, be incrementally successful, but then many may not. And so um, our goal is to really ground young people in that notion that all of the change they seek is possible, right? If you understand how democracy works and you're willing to keep participating and engaging to work towards that end. And so the power of action civics is to give educators the lexicon through which to describe that and the pedagogical um, approach to do it. And then for young people to gain that knowledge and skills, but more, more importantly, a sense of civic agency that they can be civic actors. Great, well, I think that's um, kind of where I can leave it. Um, I think we can open it up if people have questions, they can put them in the chat. Um, Alex has some questions already um, pulled together. So we can, uh, we can keep the conversation going. Great. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, we kind of answered some of my my ready made questions, um, <laughs> but uh, I think I wondered if if you had more to say on what um, some resources are that um, youth leaders can draw upon when they're when they're, you know, trying to get engaged in this. I mean, obviously you guys are here, but where else can they? And I can, I'll put it in the chat too. When I chat, everybody sees my response because I can include links to our, our website and our free resources. Um, you know, during the start of the pandemic, which feels to me like five years ago, but it was seven months ago, <laughs> um, we launched this Democracy Doesn't Pause initiative. And it was a way to take our curriculum and pull out the bite-sized chunks, right? As educators were looking for ways to engage with their students, especially um, as we were dealing with all of the racial turmoil um, and, and the like, we launched this Democracy Doesn't Pause initiative. And it was a chance to, you know, bite-sized chunks of like, how do I write an op-ed? How do I locally power map? Like, what does it mean to um, identify an issue and then take action? And so I I'm gonna include in the chat for you all, just a link to those resources for educators out there, if they're interested in learning more about our Democracy Doesn't Pause initiative, that's a great place. Um, we also have a relationship with um, Donors Choose and we started, we have this initiative called Kickstart Action Civics. So if educators are interested in learning more about Action Civics before thinking about um, how to bring Generation Citizen to their school, I'm, I'll share a link to that as well. Awesome. And we have a, a question um, from uh, a, a panel uh, from Jennifer Ladden, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, how can educators get involved with Generation Citizen? 
It's a great question. It's my favorite question. Um, so we have a, a partnership actually. So we've done a couple of trainings through the Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES and professional development sessions. And we're doing another one in the coming weeks. I can um, follow up with the league uh, individuals here just to share the exact dates and time for that. Um, and then if you're really, you know, want to talk directly to me and my colleagues about how to bring it to your school, I can also include my, my email address directly in the website, our website directly in the chat. And we'd love to talk to you more about our work. Um, like I said, at the start, it is appropriate for students in grades K, K through 12, I'm sorry, six through 12, I'm thinking of my civic readiness initiative. Um, and uh, we provide professional development and coaching for educators to implement the curriculum support with doing local power mapping. We have a partnership with the Austin School District, which is going very well, and are um, deepening that partnership this year. We are uh, in the process of training educators in peak skill to bring on the program and hopefully in White Plains. And we've worked with educators in Yonkers in the past. Um, and then we have- Denora, Sorry. just so you know, the, and for everyone, the, um, oh, Carrie just put all the, the oh. link. When you Carrie look at made magic happen. Panels, but Carrie just put them up for all the attendees. So perfect. Oh, um, sorry. I'm yes. I see now that I've I'm not <laughs> behaving properly. Thank you for that. I appreciate you, Carrie. No Zoom. No Zoom panels after cooking dinner and shooing away children. <laughs> um, we have another question. Um, what role can local government play in fostering civic action and youth leadership? It's a great question. It's one we've been thinking a lot about and actually had a partnership with the New York City uh, Department of Education on to really think about both curricular offerings, right? So how do you get civics education back in the classroom, which we have competency and expertise with. And they did, the, the mayor's office and the school department of the city had done some great work through the Civics for All initiative. Unfortunately, given budget constraints this year, they, just, they had to defund the program. Um, but we also were talking to them a lot about civic internships and civic experiences for young people. So Generation Citizen runs a program called the Community Change Fellowship. It's a um, civic leadership and, and workforce development program for high school aged alumni of our in-class program. The goal really is to say, if you are a young person who's feeling especially civic minded and want to continue your civic journey beyond the classroom, we can place you in a paid civic internship, be it with a nonprofit, good government organization, or even in government itself. So you can practice being civically engaged. One thing to learn it in a classroom, it's another to take a constituent call or to work at a nonprofit and really engage in the advocacy campaign. And so we've been doing a lot of work um, with New York City really to think about how could they build out a, and scale a program like that as a part of summer youth employment. So I would say that is one of the ways in which um, municipalities and districts could be thinking more about if this work is happening in the classroom or even if it's not, we need a civic workforce, right, for the future, with all due respect to Gen Xers and, and the boomers, like we are aging and we need young people to believe, not only believe in government, but actually want to take jobs in government. One way to do that is to cultivate the civic workforce right now while young people are feeling passionate about their ability to affect change. Um, Dinor, that just, just as a sort of like a, an add on to that, what is the length of time that you think is sort of the best amount, you know, the best length of time for um, teaching, you know, say high school kids, one of these projects, because obviously some of them are things that are going to take a lot of time. So where is that sweet spot with how many weeks or months um, do you think is the best for doing a project like this? So, you know, our approach at Generation Citizen has always been that it's at least a semester based course, right? So the, you know, the 20 lessons over the course of 10 weeks, we've had educators implement this over the course of a year and they like slow down the sequencing, they go deeper on their issue identification, they go deeper on the policy solution before they're actually getting to the end result. Um, because often, right, if you're a young person who's never been exposed to civic engagement in this way, the barrier to entry is really high, right? No one said to you before, do you know your elected officials? Did you know that it's their responsibility for you to, you know, to respond to your inquiries, et cetera? And so just even getting past that hurdle of like, no, that's not for me. I'm not supposed to do that. It's really hard. And so by the time the young people get to the midpoint of the semester where they're actually in action, as we call it, they're so excited to be a part of the conversation. They don't want the semester to end, right? And so when we've seen it go really well, it's because teachers have had the space to, to slow down the sequencing and can let the young people continue the project. Even if they don't achieve the goal, 
it, over the course of a school year, they've had the chance to keep working at it and really go deeper. Um, and really do a lot of that community building and coalition building and outreach that makes a successful project uh, thrive. One of the things that I, I often wish for and have advocated for at the state level when I was on the Civic Readiness Task Force is thinking about civic engagement and civics education as a two sequence process. So you have it a touch point that is middle school based, right? So maybe you're in sixth grade, um, maybe you're in eighth grade, which is often the two grades we work with in middle school when they're first getting the entry to social studies. Um, I could see it really fitting well in eighth grade as kind of a rite of passage to going on to high school. And then you have a second dose of civics when you're in high school, right? It's usually offered now um, through participation in government as a first semester senior level course, which is, you know, I won't get into the weeds of like, I don't think that's the right time for sequencing it. I see the trade offs in some respects from a sequencing of all the social studies. But if that is where it will remain, I think there's something really powerful about having it as an eighth grade touch point and then again at 12th grade because even the difference in projects, the difference in the way young people are thinking about themselves and their community changes over the course of those five years. So um, I would love to see it at least be a two-step mandate uh, from an educational perspective. And to the extent that educators have more time in their classrooms to have it sequenced for more than just the 10 weeks, I think that's always better. Um, I'm gonna kind of combine, so pardon my awkward wording, <laughs> um, but, um, does Generation Citizen have experience um, facilitating connections between students across communities, um, for example, a community like Chapica with a more under-resourced community and working on projects together that way? So that's one of the things that we have been working towards and, and like many of us in this moment of disruption realize that this is, we can try to solve for this, right? And technology can bridge that divide. Um, what we find often is that there are many issues that repeatedly come up in our classrooms. And if young people actually had access to a bank, either of those past projects, or like you said, the students themselves to liaise with to say like, well, where did you leave off? How can I pick that up and keep going? Or what did you try? And how did that work or not work? Um, so we really are in the process now on how to, to build more of that digital infrastructure that would allow for the cross pollination between school districts and between students who have maybe you're getting more access to civics um, and those who are getting less in a way to fuel both breaking down some of those equitable, equitable divides, but also having more collaboration in the way the projects move forward. So stay tuned is the honest answer. <laughs> awesome. maybe, maybe I'll say there'll be an app for that, but not, not just yet. <laughs> um, a lot of the daily work that um, municipal Ah, municipalities do is sort of mundane. Um, how do you, how do we make that more attractive to youth? Yeah, well, I think that's what it is, right? When it's grounded in something they care about for all of us, right? The notion of self and then how the self relates to the us and the now is when young people get hooked, right? No one or most people are not waking up every day saying, I really wish I understood how democracy works, right? Like, but it's a complex political system. And if we understood how democracy worked, and then we could connect that to um, the issues we care about, then we would be more likely to actually make a difference in our communities. And so the goal really and the power of action civics is that it can put those, you know, kind of demystify, like I said, really demystify democracy, make it accessible, both to educators who all, with all due respects, often are not teaching this content, one, because no one's holding them accountable to do it, and two, because to the extent that it feels political, which is not a bad word, but might feel partisan to teachers, they don't want to engage in that conversation, right? And so, or not, they don't want to, but they feel hesitant to, right? Um, because that is not the place of a, a public school classroom, right? And so I think it is important to note for educators that there is a way to teach about what is a very political system. We all live in a very political world, right? Even the politics for me of like, building consensus around breakfast in the morning and how do I get everybody out of the house and all of the things, <laughs> it's political, right? And it's fortunately for us, it's happening again. I'm like, all right, we gotta get to school. I forgot that we have like deadlines and all of those things. Um, that is not a bad thing, but we need to teach that and, and really give people the tools they need to be able to teach it. And so that's how we keep working at, at that work. I thought I saw a question in the chat around, is this possible to integrate in other subjects besides social studies? So I would answer that to say affirmatively, yes. Um, we've seen it implemented very well um, 
implemented very well in um, ELA classes, right? So in humanities-based um, humanities-based English classes, really combining the text that students are learning with how do you then take action on issues re relevant to that text. Um, we've also seen it implemented in many science classrooms, right? So we worked with a high school for environmental studies in Manhattan, where they integrated across all of their um, environmental uh, science classes and the young people were thinking about environmental science related projects. And so that was just an interesting way to combine um, science and, and civic engagement. So it is not just confined to um, you know, traditional social studies or histories or civic space classes. Um, can the Generation Citizen work be infused into other courses, six to 12, instead of a semester course? So we have seen it implemented in other courses that are not just a semester long course. We do, you know, what's interesting for us when we think about our theory of change and how do we, um, how do we actually accomplish our theory of change and ensuring that all students, especially those who have historically been marginalized in our democracy have access to civics. We think about it as not feeling like an elective, right? So if a young person has to raise their hand to join, then they more than likely understood the proposition and were inclined, civically inclined already, right? Those are not the students necessarily who we need to make sure that they are gaining that civic knowledge and skills. We need to get to the young people who have never been exposed to democracy, right? And the way that you're largely going to do that is in a, a general population classroom that everybody has access to. Um, because then the students who wouldn't otherwise have raised their hand, and we hear this from educators all of the time, is like the young person who's always, you know, sitting quietly, is, I'm sure learning, but in a different way, the minute they have the chance to have some ownership over their academic setting and environment and what they're learning, their hands are shooting up much more quickly than normal. And so that's what's powerful about this is getting to the students who are the hardest to reach and the least likely to, to be civically inclined already. Um, we have a question. Um, can you elaborate more about Civics Day? How does it provide an authentic audience? So Civics Day is this, I, I don't, I get so um, nostalgic when I talk about Civics Day. So I didn't talk about it too much because I'm like, I don't even know the next time is we'll, we'll have a Civics Day. Um, but it is this really powerful um, end of semester symposium, a chance for young people to really present their civic action to community leaders like all of you who are here on this call this evening and get feedback on how they accomplish the goal, right? So if you think about a young person, they're more often than not interacting with educators in their school building and their parents, right? But they don't often interact directly with elected officials or decision makers or policy makers or even advocates. And so Civics Day is this chance to take the idea that you came up with, talk about all the civic actions you took or in the process of taking and get feedback on like, if I were, if you were doing this, if you cared about um, environmental or water quality in a school building, what else would you think of to do to address that? Um, so you're getting a chance to pitch your ideas, really practice oral and written persuasive communication skills to get another 21st century life skill and workforce skill. You're also getting a chance to um, talk to adults, right, who are not in your trusted circle of adults and have a chance to get feedback on both that civic project, but also how do you stay civically engaged short term and long term, right? So you're thinking like, well, how do, how do I run for office or how do I get a career in government? And so it's a good chance for um, young people to present in, in a public setting, kind of like a science fair for civics is what we describe it to, or a shark tank for civics. So for those <laughs> who are watching lots of shark tank these days. Um, I have been a, a judge, I guess it's a judge or a Community advisor is what we try to call them now. Right, I think the judge was a harsh word for it. A yeah. Advisor. I mean, it is really um, a, a really inspiring day to see the kids and to see the, um, you know, the different things that they come up with and, um, you know, the depth of sort of how they start to understand a, a problem. So, you know, say one group of kids was saying, you know, we're, we share space in terms of our high schools. We only get art and the other school only gets music. We don't understand why we can't have both. And then, you know, I think their appreciation for what went on in the administration and how they were going to try and problem solve together. Um, the good advice that they were getting from the teacher, you know, who was advising them was really great. And, um, you know, it, it was really inspiring. A lot of league members do it. I remember when I went, there were a lot of um, city league members there and, um, it's a, it really is inspiring to see the kids come up with something that's important to them and then present it 
um, and, and really take the feedback. So, um, and, and see some of the kids who were really, really did, um, you know, shine in the moment. And then kids who clearly, this was really hard for them, but they did it anyway. And then they started to feel good about it. So if it ever comes back, everybody should sign up. If, I don't know what the plan is in Austin or peak skill, you know, when you're doing it, if you need extra people, you know, league members are kind of ready-made for that. Um, so. Absolutely. Yeah, and our hope is that we can do something in person, right? Even if it's smaller, but if not, definitely Zoom breakout rooms work just well as well for young people to present their ideas. So we'll make sure to uh, to, to keep you abreast of that opportunity because it is it's such a powerful moment and it, it inspires us to like remember that people, you know, that the young people are here and they're ready, and so we have to let them we have to let them lead too. Nor do we have time for one more question? Okay, we've got, um, um, we have one that says many years ago, um, we had civics in my elementary school. I think that perhaps we can start the curriculum at the young child level. For example, what's public versus private, the public library, the postal service, uh, service et cetera. Um, concepts that start interest engagement of people in government. What do you think? Um, and then a kind of a side question about how does uh, League of Women Voters Youth Committee committees start to connect the social studies administrators as not educators? So. Mm -hmm. No, it's a good question. It's one that we talked about a lot during the Civic Readiness Task Force work. Um, there definitely is uh, a thought or thought process and a, I think a longer term strategy at the state level to work towards this PK to um, fully PK to 12 interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach to civic learning. And there is a lot of work that is being done at, at the lower school level to the point that you raised. Um, especially around community service and understanding who the decision makers are and, and, and beginning to issue identify, right? Because if you ask a young person, they know what's happening in their communities, they see it themselves. Um, and so there are ways to begin to incorporate that learning at the lower grade level. Um, you know, the state, when it was thinking about this initiative in particular, realized that there were limited resources and capacity in an already um, very full academic, rigorous and academic um, expectations for students. And so the hope was that this could be something that was sequenced in later. And so I think there is an opportunity though for the, the league and its youth committee to be pushing the state education department, advocating for the state education department to really take that more seriously and to begin to, through their content advisory panel, begin to build out more resources for younger grades. Right, I, I think the, uh, was it Laura Ladd Behrman from the, from the league was on the civic Readiness Task Force? He absolutely is. Yeah, we work very closely together, um, which is exciting. And, she, and she's been a great um, thought partner in, in a lot of that work and really thinking about how to move it forward and also get more leagues to embrace the importance of this work and the pilot that will be coming down the pike for sure. Um, let's see, I think, I think that might be it for our questions. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, let me just say, I'll, I'll just have a few comments. I really want to thank Denora for just a fabulous presentation and thank you for your time tonight. I also want to thank our audience for their questions. They were certainly thought provoking and, and it's really a, an interesting topic about youth engagement. Now, you know, at the league, we believe that democracy is not a spectator sport. So I wanna remind people that early voting for the general election is for, from October 24th to November 1st. We have 17 early voting sites here in Westchester County. And unlike on election day, you can go to whichever site is most convenient. So please check the Westchester Board of Elections website for locations and hours. Also, you can apply now online for an absentee or mail-in ballot. I also wanna remind you that your local league is made up of volunteers who devote their time and energy to make democracy work. You can find more information about the league at lwvnewcastle.org. Your participation and assistance are always welcome and your financial contributions would be appreciated. Thank you again, everyone, please stay safe and have a wonderful evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.